Those who enter the millennium in natural bodies, how do they do this? Are they regular flesh people that are from far away places hidden to most men? Please help make sense of how they survived. So look at the chart with me for a minute. And if you look at the millennium there and you can see the second coming. So the, the question that's being asked is, as you think about Daniel's 70th week, as you think about the, the seven years uh, in, described in, in Daniel 9, and, and all the, the terrible things that go on on the earth that are described in detail in Revelation, how do people survive that in natural bodies? You know, the water turns to blood, there's pestilence, there's all kinds of problems. So get with me, Matthew 24, verse 15. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. And what we're going to see is that God enables certain members of the believing remnant to survive the Great Tribulation. Now, it's very clear in Scripture that there will be some Gentiles that enter into the millennium, uh, but there are also certain members of the believing remnant that survive the Great Tribulation. So Matthew 24, 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, when the abomination of desolation is set up, what does God command the believing remnant to do? Flee. And he, and he tells them to flee into the mountains. Look with me at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 1. Revelation 12, 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now notice verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness. The woman here is representative of believing Israel. The woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. What's going on there is the woman is fleeing into the wilderness and God has a place prepared for her to flee to. And he's going to provide for the remnant for a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's the that's three and a half years the last three and a half years of the 70th week. Look with me at verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, that's when Satan, the devil, has been kicked out of heaven in the middle of the 70th week. He's cast down to the earth. So that's, that's the time frame. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now notice this. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So let's, let's understand verse 14. You see where it says a time, and then it says times, and then it says half a time? Well, a time is one, times is two, and a half time is a half time. So if you add one plus two plus a half, you get 
three and a half. That's the, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. We were just in verse 6, where it talks about 1,203 score days. In the scripture, a year is 360 days. Now, in, in modern life, we think of a year as 365.24 or 25 days. In other words, 365 days and approximately a quarter more, and that's why you have leap years once every four years, right? So that's, that's how we think of a year. It, in Scripture, a year is 360 days. And so if you take 360, you multiply it by three and a half, you get the 1,260 that you see in verse 6. Now, if you notice verse 14 again, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place. So what God does is he, he equips the believing remnant. He gives them wings. I don't think necessarily that every member of the believing remnant, you know, is given wings like that. But they're given some sort of capability to flee into the wilderness. Something to consider. Who are the two witnesses described in Revelation. They're, they're Moses and Elijah. Now, when you think of Elijah, is there ever any time where he was able to move particularly quickly? He was. There's times where he was picked up and moved and set down. And so I, it seems like God does something like that with the believing remnant during the 70th week. Verse 15, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ." So the question was, how does the believing remnant survive the 70th week? Well, there's some things supernatural that go on where, where God has a place prepared and he gives them wings and he enables them to do this. Now, notice a couple things with me. Go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Now notice verse 3. And all the world wondered after the beast. So when the beast comes to power, how much of the world does he influence? The entire world, right? Because the whole world wondered after the beast. Get with me Daniel 11 verse 36. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36. So Daniel 11 and verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. What you're reading about in Daniel 11, verses 36 and verse 37, I think is the same thing as the abomination of desolation, where the beast goes into the temple showing himself that he is God. Now notice Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, and this is where it gets very interesting. It tells us something about the beast. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. So we know that the whole world wonders after the beast. We know the beast enters into the glorious land, and we know that many countries shall be overthrown. But notice what it then says. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So let's look at a map together. Are you ready? 
So here's a map, and let's just make sure we understand what we're looking at. You can see here the kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem, you can see right there. Judea is the region that surrounds Jerusalem. So when it talks about those in Judea fleeing to the mountains, it's talking about that area right there. You can see the northern kingdom of Israel right there. Now, what I want you to notice is this. Verse 41 says, But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, that's right here, south of Judah, Moab, right north of Eden, you can see right there, and then the chief of the children of Ammon. So in other words, basically what's on the, the right side there of the, um, the Red Sea, is th that whole land area escapes the influence of the beast. So I'll make an observation. You can decide whether or not this is true. The beast comes to power. He destroys other kings. He conquers them. The world wonders after the beast. So his influence is over the entire world. And yet, in his own backyard, there's land that he cannot control. Well, which is harder to conquer? Stuff that's much farther away or stuff that's closer? Don't you have more power typically in your immediate vicinity than much farther away? The fact that Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon escape the beast clutches is not accidental. It's not a coincidence. I'm going to suggest to you there's a specific reason for it. Guess what it is? Because there has to be a place for the believing remnant to flee where they can be protected from the beast. And I suspect that that is where, in that, that region there, that is where the believing remnant flees, and they're protected from the face of the serpent. Get with me Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on His right hand, Come, ye blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Go down to verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So when you think about the millennium, and you think about how do people survive in natural bodies into the millennium, there's, there's two big things that are going on. What we just read in Matthew 25, when the Lord judges the nations, the Gentiles that blessed Israel when they were hungered and they fed them, when they were thirsty and they gave them water, those Gentiles that blessed Israel, God brings into the kingdom and they inherit, you know, they, they, they participate in the millennial kingdom. Those Gentiles that cursed Israel, they're cast into everlasting fire. What happens to believing Israel is that part of believing Israel is martyred. Right? They're killed during Daniel's 70th week. But there are some that are able to flee into the wilderness because God has a place that's there prepared for them. 
they survive the 70th week in natural bodies. They go into the millennium, and they are in natural bodies during the millennium. And what happens at that point is that they reproduce, and they produce many, 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 many people during that time because they're in natural bodies, and there is peace during that time.